Obviously, we've praised a ton. It's insane. It deserves praise. Uh, I really am, am hoping that they win the recruiting crown. I've been talking about that for a while. And there's enough firepower left on the board to be able to get it done. It's going to come down to LSU, Georgia, Texas, and Ohio State at the end. Georgia's moving really slow with their class. They're incredibly selective with who they offer in-state. The big men talent in Georgia obviously has always been excellent, but it keeps growing every year. It's, it's, it's pretty amazing. When we talk about these guys had Isaiah Gibson and Justice Terry go ahead and sign with USC, and they still didn't come off of them because they're still so confident they're going to get them. And they never pivoted and offered London Merritt. I was worried for a bit that they were going to try to flip him. They've never offered London Merritt. London Merritt's fantastic. And they're not after him. I don't understand it. I don't understand it. But uh, the, the depth of big, bad dudes in that state is just growing by the year. And it's insane. So I wanted to go over this class, kind of see where we're at, each position group, who's left on the board, who I really want, who I think we got a good shot at, um, how we think it might end up as a whole. But obviously, we're incredibly happy so far. The top end talent of this class, when we talk about Tavian, and Devin and Naeem, seems to me like the three most surefire can't miss prospects we've had in a very long time. Offensive line and defensive tackle are the two areas that need need some help right now. So currently 13 commits. Let's start on defense. Um, at edge, the aforementioned London Merritt, obviously a big time player and Zaheer Mathis. Those are two big timers. The next year that room's going to include Caden Curry, Kenyatta Jackson, Mitchell Melton, Edric Houston, Dominic Kirks, London and Zaheer. So uh, that that's an unbelievable unbelievable room. Like th those are some serious studs, but one more would be great. And that would bring us up to eight. And that would be the ideal number. Um, Shanklin is the guy I think is number one on their board right there. Mary and I would probably be second. They have yet to offer Ohio Cedric works. Those two first dudes are out of Indiana. Um, but you know, if I think works is probably maybe in their plans, if something falls through with Shanklin, but as it looks right now, I think Damian Shanklin is a Buckeye lean. So when it's all said and done, that's going to be an excellent class if it ends up being that with London Merritt, Zaheer Mathis, and Damian Shanklin. Those are some super studs. At safety, they wanted three or four all along. Um, next year's room is going to look like Caleb, Malik, Jalen McClain, uh, Jaden Bonsu. And after losing Jihad Carter, I think the number is probably more like four that they're going to want here. So they got the two guys that were a little lower on their board and Cody Haddad and Deshaun Stewart, who, in my opinion, are both absolute steals and play way bigger than what they're rated by the services, particularly Cody Haddad. Uh, that guy, obviously, he only played four games last year, which really dinged him. He is a super stud. And then you got number one and two in the country and Fahim Delane and Trey McNutt on the board. They're obviously big in after both of them. And we'll see what happens with them. If either fall through, they got two to three guys as secondary plans that they're pretty high on. I checked them all out. You know, th there's a considerable drop off, as, as you would imagine. We're talking about the number one and number two safeties in the country. But if they can just get one of Trey or Fahim to pair with Cody Haddad and Deshaun and maybe have one more of those other guys, that's a fantastic class. At corner, I mean, it's a 10 out of 10, obviously with uh, Devin Sanchez, Naeem, and Blake Woodby. Um, it doesn't get any better than that. You can't get any better than that unless you had, unless Blake Woodby was the number three instead of the number six. Um, it's unbelievable. It's fantastic. I love seeing the relationship between Devin and Naeem growing, the way that they uh, want to play together, push each other, and be the best unit in the country is something special to see. It's really cool. Obviously, Devin has been uh, Devin and the family have been kind of the the spearheads of this entire class, and we obviously love them for that. Um, so that that's been fantastic to watch as well. Uh, but Blake would be visited Oregon about ten days ago, and Oregon is hard after him. He really enjoyed his visit. Is there a potential uh, flip coming with him? I don't know. I don't know. But he liked it. 
they're after him hard. And if I'm them, I can certainly see if I'm Oregon, I can certainly see uh, the pitch that they're making to Blake would be. I mean, he is coming in with the number one and number two guys in the country in his class. So we'll see, man, but, but it's getting, it's getting really heavy and aggressive. Um, at linebacker, Eli Lee, uh, absolute stud, incredibly underrated. When you think about this, this kid just won the MVP. We, we just saw Justin Hill. He just won the MVP down there. And uh, he, he's awesome. Incredibly underrated at a three-star still. Uh, I haven't seen anybody remind me so much of James Laurinaitis since James Laurinaitis himself. Um, the dude's going to be fantastic. He's going to play a ton at some point in his career. I don't think he's going to be some guy that just washes out. That's for sure. And Tarvis Alford is a super stud. So with Eli Lee, TJ Alford, and of course, they're all in on Justin Hill at that jack position. That would be a sick linebacker class. And next year, the room is going to look like, um, well, hopefully, CJ and Sonny are still there. Or maybe not hopefully. I mean, I guess if, if one play is good enough to leave and, and go get drafted high, then, then that would mean we had a great year. But CJ, Sonny, Arvell Reese, Gabe Powers, Peyton Pierce, and adding in Eli, TJ, and Justin Hill. Oh, it's been a while since we've had a ton of confidence in the linebacker room. I think we're finally coming around to that. Obviously, James leading the way is fantastic. And with those pieces in place, yeah, man, it, the recruiting is getting better. Um, the whole unit as a whole looks better. Hopefully, James means it when he says he thinks he's got five this year and we see more play. At quarterback, 10 out of 10, it doesn't get any better than the number one overall player in the class, which I think Tavian will be when we get to that point. So, dude's obviously, I mean, what else do we need to say about him? Running back. So, next year's running back room is going to look like this. James Peoples, T.C. Caffey, and Sam Williams-Dixon uh, in that order on the depth chart. That's a young room, and you're going to want to bring in, obviously, two, maybe three if possible. Bo Jackson and Jordan Davison both look pretty promising right now. And why wouldn't it be promising to them when you think of it? Look at that depth board. So they're coming in with James Peoples, and then you got T.C. Caffey and Sam Williams-Dixon. It looks like one or both of them for sure needs to play their freshman year because they're immediately going to jump over T.C. and Sam Williams-Dixon. That is a heck of an opportunity um, to be able to walk in to a place like Ohio State and play almost guaranteed as a freshman. So it would seem to me like uh, we're going to land those two at this current point, and that would be excellent. So obviously that would be a home run class. But if we only landed one and we had to, quote, settle for D'Air Hill or Shakai Mills Knight, it would still be a 9 out of 10 class to me. I watched both of those guys. I broke down Shakai on the show here, bigger back, sturdy, nasty, loves contact, loves football. And I, I talked about him for a while, broke down some highlights. We never did. Um, we never did uh D air Hill. So I broke down maybe five quick runs of D air Hill. I wanted to pull up. So this dude's out of Illinois and he is 5'11, 180. Number 108 in the class. I think he's a good type of back to add to chips, uh, chip system. A little bit smaller, a little bit faster and shiftier. Oh, oh. Yeah, he, he's sick. He's sick. Dude can definitely play. So if you miss out on a bow or a Jordan and you add that guy or Shakai Mills Knight, I think I'd probably take Deer over Shakai Mills Knight. 
I was a little down on Deere when I first saw him. If you if you watch his film, they got him lined up all over the place. They're trying to be creative with him, whatever, and you, and you kind of lose out. And I kind of dismissed him a little quicker than I should have because the middle of the tape it gets rolling with this guy scored so many touchdowns. It was it was unbelievable. But that dude is a is a dude. So pair him with either of those two at the top, and you got yourself an excellent running back class. Nine or ten out of ten um, at tight end. They're going to need two for sure. You're going to lose G, you're going to lose Kaz, and you're going to lose Patrick Gerd. So that leaves you in a room with Jelani, Bennett Christian, Max LeBlanc. And they keep saying Demarion Witten is going to be a tight end. Uh, I'm not so sure. I don't know. What do you guys think? He's only 215 pounds right now. He moves like a wide receiver. Um, it would take an awful lot of weight for him to uh, – like we've just watched this experiment with G Scott. It, it, it's not worked out swimmingly with him transferring to tight end. He's been a tight end for four years now. Um, still struggles quite a bit with blocking. So if I'm to believe that Keenan Bailey is the guy to turn this Demarion Witten into a tight end, I, I don't know. I think it's a little far fetched at 215 pounds, but you know, Hey, crazier things have happened. But the Bucs are uh, in, obviously, they got Nate Roberts in the class, who is amazing. I think he is underrated. I think he's the third best tight end in this class after there's two super studs in this class at tight end, just mammoth dudes. He's right behind them. Uh, he really moves tremendously for his size. This guy averaged 21 yards a catch from the tight end's position. That's insane. Bucks are also in big on Brody Glenn. Um, Brody Glenn from uh, Gates Mills up around Cleveland. He's a three-star guy, about 6'3", 220. Got some weight to gain, but dude's a football player, and I can't imagine him saying no to Ohio State as a three-star tight end out of Cleveland. Um, so I imagine that he will be a member of this class. At wide receiver, currently nobody committed yet. Uh, I think that Jamie French and Trey Brown are both almost locks to be in this class. Uh, they, they really have seen, felt like that for quite a while to me now. And we're talking about Jamie French, a five-star, Trey Brown, a top 50 overall. Uh, these dudes are bad. These dudes are bad. And DeCorian Moore just visited over this weekend. I don't know how it went, but I saw some pictures that they put out, and it looked like they were having a heck of a time. So that would be awesome. I know that uh, – Devin Sanchez has uh, been in on that one big time. Um, DeCorey Moore, the number one wide receiver in the country. Uh, his film is pretty sick. If you want to have some fun uh, for, for 10 minutes, anytime you see a 10-minute highlight, number one, you cue that up, and, and th that's a good sign, right? But this guy is just fantastic. At defensive tackle, um, they've kind of been – I don't know. man. I, I feel like they might have slow played them into uh, – in, into a poor position here, to be honest. You're looking at uh, two guys right now in Trajan Odom and Cole Breeler. Uh, Odom's definitely a riser. Dude's 6'5", 270. Uh, both are, you know, 300 to 400 ranked guys. Um, Odom's big. He can move. He looks like he could be a player. Cole Breeler is more of a developmental guy to me. Um, there's not much film on him, but of the film that there is, he's the second best defensive lineman on his team out of Princeton, New Jersey. That's clear. Um, and the better one is going to Michigan. So, Hey, I don't know. I'm, I'm sure they've seen something else in this guy. I did watch him give an interview and he's certainly a sharp young dude who really loves football and, and seems like, you know, he's got the right stuff about him. Uh, physically I didn't see it, but you know, I trust their evaluation more than mine. But last but certainly not least, offensive line. There is a graphic floating around highlighting that offensive linemen who were drafted in the first round and, and where they were rated coming out of high school and pretty low or converted from a different position is the answer in that graphic. And that's not an anomaly. Uh, we see that a lot in the first round of the NFL draft when it comes to offensive linemen because offensive linemen are the hardest position to project because there's so much growth that goes on with an offensive lineman from the time he's 18 to the time he's 22. 
and because it's largely a developmental position. Um, so a bunch of people are saying, see, Justin Fry is good. Like that's what they're getting out of that graphic. Now, I'd like to point out to those folks who are pointing at Justin Fry and saying, see, this isn't so bad, um, that uh, every school who recruits poorly saw that graphic and said the same thing. So if that's your standard, that's cool. It's not mine. Argue with your mama about that one. Um, but uh, Justin Fry has just now offered five-star Josh Petty out of Georgia, a guy that a lot of us have been clamoring for the Buckeyes to get in on for a while. Uh, meanwhile, Georgia, Clemson, Notre Dame, Tennessee, and Auburn all have had their hooks in on him for quite some time, but they did get him to commit to coming for a visit, according to Chad Simmons of On3. Did they wait too long? Um, I don't know, but we talked the other day about the number of offers on the offensive line being half that of Michigan, Georgia, and Alabama. And I don't understand the strategy here, but what I do understand is that Alabama, Georgia, and Michigan all have offensive lines that outperform Ohio State's. So if Fry is somehow trying to outsmart them with a less is more strategy in the offer department, it's not working. Now, Petty's a state championship wrestler, quick off the ball, 6'5", 280. He'd be great. He'd be amazing. Uh, Adam DeCarter Lowe and everything I've ever said about Justin Fry, I, I rescind. But I don't think it's very likely. Two other guys that are more realistic, which is crazy to say more realistic when I'm talking about the Ohio State Buckeyes in recruiting. Um, listen, these guys are ranked in the 480 to 850 range. Now, I'm not some got to be highly rated guy. I want to be able to trust the position coaches evaluations. And if it was a wide receiver or a defensive back ranked 450 to 850 in the country, I would say, Oh, so gee, well, it's Brian Hartline. Uh, if he says that's the dude he wants, I want him to have that dude, right? I'm not there yet with Justin Fry. I don't know how you guys feel. I'm not there yet uh, because as offensive line is a largely developmental position, I've not seen a lot of development out of the offensive linemen on the roster. Now, let's talk about one of those more realistic options because you're going to like this one. Andrew Stargell, uh, unranked in 24-7. I mean, not even a ranking. And he's a kid from Georgia playing 6A ball who's 6'5", 285. Now, I found that odd. Um, and after I watched his film, I found it really odd. Other than he doesn't move too well laterally or have the quickest of feet, um, this dude is something different and something you don't often see in offensive linemen. So I pulled up some of his film to share with you guys. Um, this guy is one of the nastier offensive linemen I've ever seen in my life. And <laughs> It, it, this might make you somewhat uncomfortable. Like, honestly, I got mixed reactions on this one. Uh, my wife certainly did not like it as some of these guys are about 185 pounds that he absolutely brutalizes, but it's something. So there, there, there's always a little extra with this dude. I mean, he, he just crushes him. He loves football. He can't, he, he's very intense. There's no doubting that. So this is the guy Fry's after here. And again, he is ranked 825 by on three. No ranking from 24-7. You got to like him as a, as a developmental guy. I mean, certainly when you see somebody who appears to uh, have the size and the tenacity, it's always someone you want on the team. I mean, he's just he's, he's just nasty. 71 knockdowns, they say, in his in his clip here. 71 knockdowns. Now, 
like they're really playing up the fact that he is nasty. And I just put some of the milder stuff because some of it really is uncomfortable. Like there's a lot of penalties. There's a lot of holding. There's a lot of after the whistle stuff. Uh, and I did not like it at first. Like I was like, man, this dude, like this dude's a punk, but you know, an offensive lineman with a little nasty edge to him uh, to add into the group might be a good thing because a lot of times offensive linemen, they're big, but they're, you know, a little softer in demeanor. Sometimes this dude's not. So I wouldn't mind having him on the roster at all. But again, um, it's just felt to me more like this cycle is not Fry targeting lower guys that he's finding as diamond in the roughs, but it is missing out and then readjusting the board and then missing out. And, you know, we started off high, then you go down to the Avery gotchas and drop down again, miss out, drop down again. Avery gotcha is going to sign with Michigan. Um, and it just feels like, you know, miss, drop down, miss, drop down, miss, drop down. But then we talk about next year in the class of 2026 and the offers the the top 10 linemen in the country are, have eight out of eight out of 10 of them have offers from Alabama and Georgia. And only two of those guys have offers from Ohio state. It's just like, I don't understand the strategy here. I really don't. And he is recruiting behind all of his peers on the staff. So when you got a blueprint laid out, Right. And you can say that there is a blueprint laid out by Alabama and Georgia when it comes to offensive line play. Like one of two things is happening here. Either he's just being lazy or he thinks he has a better way to do it. Um, either way, I disagree. Right. So anyway, that's all I'm going to say about this guy. I feel like I I feel like I bag on this guy all the time and I don't like to bag on somebody all the time. I feel like it's garbage. But. Um, I just don't, uh, I mean, I, I don't, I also dislike that. I feel like a lot of people come out and defend him because they're friends of him because he has a lot of friends in the media 